Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forget his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Father, we pray that you would be with us this morning as we seek to preach your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for the encouragement it is to be here. We thank you for the word that you have provided for us. And Lord, we just ask that you would be with us for a few minutes this morning as we seek to learn, as we seek to edify, as we seek to present the things that uh, we believe you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. This may not be considered a typical Sunday morning uh, message. It may be a little bit different than the norm, but um, if I can, I wanted to give you a little encouragement this morning. The Bible is a book of generations, and all of its pages from, from the beginning to the end, it actually covers all the generations. From, from the first generation, who was Adam, to the last generation. We don't know who exactly that's going to be, but Christ is going to come back. Amen? So it's a book of generations. It's pages from beginning to end. We find all the generations. We find some good things that happened in some of those uh, generations. We find some bad things. We find some disappointing things. We find some instructional things. And each generation learned some things from the previous generation, and that's what uh, we're talking about here in this scripture. They learned some good things, and they probably learned some bad things. Verse number three, it says, These things that he is going to utter we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Now, I don't know about you, but I did not personally know Adam and Eve. You would have had to live quite a long time uh, in order to know them. Although, if you go back and study the, uh, the lines and how long everybody lived, you know, just about the time, you know, right up to just about Abraham's time, Adam was still alive. Um, that's amazing to me. Think about how many generations they could ask questions of and, and how long uh, that those, those people had been around in order to learn all the things that, uh, that they learned. So we learn the things that we have heard and known our fathers have told us. I didn't get to see Abraham leave his home. I didn't get to see Elijah defeat the prophets of Baal. I didn't watch as David defeated Goliath. I would have loved to have been there, though, wouldn't you? Watch David defeat Goliath. What a scene that would have been. I probably would have been hidden on the sidelines with my sandwich. Something just... <clears throat> watching what was going on. I didn't get to see Job as he suffered or Solomon as he ruled, but I can read about those things in the Word of God. Amen. And we can see the character of the people that are, in, are involved. We can see all of, the, all of the good points. We can see some of the flaws. We can see the problems and the things that, that they had to deal with. 
You know what? They were people. They were people just like you and I are people. They had the same passions that we have. They say they had likes and they had dislikes. and They had things that they were interested in and things that they were not at all interested in. But it's good to be able to read about these things and learn about these things. And we should not take it for granted that God has given us these things to instruct us. And so we learn things from our fathers. And I can know that I serve the same God that they served. Although not as well, probably, as they did. But we learn what our fathers have taught us. Sometimes that's good, and sometimes, as we learn in Sunday school this morning, sometimes it's not so good. You know, fathers are human beings. We have faults. We have hobby horses, we have weak points, we hopefully have a few strong points, and all of that will sort itself out, but we learn what our fathers have told us. Verse number four, then, he says in, in an encouraging fashion, he said, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. We will not hide those things from our children. You know, we need, if you are living today, you are a member of a generation. And even right here, we've got at least four to maybe five generations of people that are just right here this morning. And every one of us, has a place, a generational place, in our lives. It doesn't seem all that long ago that, that uh, I got married, <clears throat> but that was uh, two or three generations ago. Generations go by quickly, and we move from being pretty young and energetic to being pretty old and weak and stupid in a big hurry. It doesn't take very long. But if there's one thing that we need to do is to take our generational place and understand that there's going to be another generation. And for that other generation, they are going to learn some things and they are going to learn some things from us. Whether they be good things or whether they be bad things, they're going to learn the things that we provide to them. We need to show the generation to come. If you're a parent this morning, let me encourage you that you are responsible for the spiritual education of your children. The school certainly will not do it. The church is not fit, is not outfitted to do it on a continual basis. It is outfitted to provide spiritual direction and to support you in your work. But if you just think that bringing your kid to Sunday school for an hour a week is going to make a spiritual giant out of them, you are seriously mistaken. Our, our Sunday school teachers are wonderful. And by the way, it's hard to find Sunday school teachers <clears throat> because in the day in which we live, nobody wants to commit to anything. So if you can find Sunday school teachers, you're doing well. So I applaud the Sunday school teachers. But they have your kids one hour a week. Actually, not even an hour. Because for kids, by the time you get them in and try to get them settled down, you've got about 10 minutes left. <clears throat> and then they're itching to go. You know, they're, oh, we got here. It's time to leave. So that's, that's how, you know, dealing with kids. I taught young people for several years. And so I know a little bit about them. And amazing as this may seem, I was one once. And so we know a little bit about that too. But we're showing the generation to come, and we are responsible mainly for the spiritual education of our children. They won't get that from social media. They'll get a lot of junk from social media, but they won't get instruction in spiritual things from social media. 
Oh, they may see one of those little, what do they call, are they, how do you pronounce that? Meme or Mimi? Is it, <laughs> I just wondered what that was. I'm not too technical. Um, and, and I don't spend a lot of time doing that stuff. But, 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 you know, you may post one of those things once in a while, like, do you love Jesus? That's easy to post somewhere. But I have a question for you. Do you love Jesus? Because that's not quite so easy to answer. Let me ask you another question. Would Jesus say that you love Jesus? Instead of spending all your time on social media, you might consider spending some time in the book that he gave us and doing things that are profitable to our spiritual instruction. And we are responsible for that with our children. They're not going to get it from media. They're not going to get it from their friends. <clears throat> mostly what they will get from their friends is not spiritual. Now, I've known people that say that they go to school so that they can be a witness and be a positive influence for their friends. The only problem was their friends didn't know that. Their friends had no idea that that's why they were there. And so there's something a little bit wrong with that picture. We need to understand that, generally speaking, positive influences are hard to come by because everything kind of reduces itself to the lowest common denominator. That's kind of how human beings work. So they won't get that spiritual encouragement normally from their friends. They might, in the church, that's what the church is for, amen, and you might know people that could give you some encouragement spiritually. But the basic way that you're going to learn those things is from the former generation. You're going to learn the things that are important to you and the things that you know from the former generation. So please, if you have a generation that's older than you, don't just write them off. They've been around longer than you have. They may have a few more experiences than you do. They might have a good idea every once in a while. And they might know something about life. I know, I, I know that when kids get to be about 16 up through about 35, they think that they know it all and they don't need any advice. You say, 35, that's not a kid. Well, it is to me. And they just think that everything's rosy and they know what's best for them. And, you know, they set their priorities the way they're going to set them, which is not usually very smart. And that's the way they'll conduct their life. And unless God intercedes, that's the way they'll finish their life. Because people may get older, but they do not grow up. Those two things are entirely different from one another. They must get that from the former generation. If they're going to show the praises of the Lord, as he says, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, if they're going to show that, they've got to get that somewhere. And that somewhere is going to have to be you and I, whatever generation we're in, because we have a generation yet to come. If you're, if you're 20 years old today and you're here, there's, a gener there's already a generation behind you. And they're watching you to see how your life is going to play out. And to see how some of you who made professions of, of faith and going to serve God, how, how that's going to go. Are you going to do that? Are you going to put God first in your life? Are you going to say, whatever it is, I'm going to serve God? Because they'll be watching. And if you blow it, they'll know. They'll know. We must be faithful because they're watching. We must show his strength in our weakness because they are watching. We must show his wonderful works in our lives. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. 
Verse number five says, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. So God has established some things that we need to pay attention to or we're going to reap the results of them in our children. So when it comes time after the morning message and you go home and you have the preacher for lunch, remember, and I don't mean having the preacher over to your house for lunch, I mean having the preacher for lunch. Remember that your kids are there. And they see and they hear. And they watch your life. And they say, you know, it's kind of a dichotomy here because, you know, I go to church and we say, boy, we really like to go and we like to hear the preaching and he steps on our toes every once in a while. But we don't do anything about it. Does it make a difference in our life? Is what we're doing teaching our children? Well, you're teaching your children something. So that we can teach our children. Well, what are we supposed to teach them? Well, fortunately, the scripture tells us what we're supposed to teach them. We're supposed to teach them, verse number seven, number one, that they might set their hope in God. Do our kids see that our hope is in God? Is that, is that the number one thing that our kids would see from us is that our hope is in God? Or would they see that every time we have to make a decision, we do what's more convenient, irrespective of what God says? Or we have a good reason, that's Greek for excuse, <laughs> as to why we don't do what God says. There's always a good reason for not doing what God says. Right? And we can come up with that. That they should set their hope in God. Do our kids see that our hope is in God? Do we share the gospel with our children? Listen, the one, the one people that you can share the gospel with is your kids. I mean, you have them, right? They, they, are, they cannot escape. And so you can share the gospel with your children. If you, if you can't share it with anybody else, if you don't think that you have the wherewithal uh, to share the gospel with anybody else, you can share it with your children. Not only that, you must share it with your children. Because in order to be saved, kids need to hear the gospel. Amen? Now, I know there are those that believe you don't have to hear it to be saved, but I am not one of them. I believe you must be exposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to experience salvation. People do not get saved and not know it. And so they must be exposed to that. Do we pray for our kids' spiritual success? Oh, I know we pray for all kinds of other success. We pray that they'll get a good job so they won't be a, a millstone around our neck. And we pray that they'll, that, you know, that they'll have a family and that they'll stay to themselves. And we pray that God will provide them with much success. And we pray that they'll have, you know, their education will be good and, and we want them to succeed. But what do we mean when we say succeed? Do we want them to succeed in the eyes of the world? Do we want them to run a big business? Well, we want them to have a good bank account so they can take care of us when we get old. But what do we mean by wanting our children to have success? If you can have five or six kids and they're all doctors and lawyers, that's a success, right? Not if they're lost. There's no success in that. Because 100 years from now, on their gravestone, it's going to just have their name just like yours and just like everybody else's. And nobody's going to know. 
but the Lord's going to know. We need to pray for their spiritual success. Not necessarily their worldly success, although I believe we should pray for them to be able to serve God and get by. The best advice you can ever give to your child is that he might set his hope in God. Not in the things of this world, not in the things he can do for himself. Because, you know, we can't always do things for ourselves. And it doesn't take long sometimes for God to teach us that we cannot do things for ourselves. Teach them about Jesus. He's the way, the truth, the life. Do something important for your kids. That they should not forget still in verse number seven, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Now, if their parents forget the works of God, they're going to forget the works of God. Yeah. It's important for parents, as much as in us is, to finish well. Because you can live your whole life and just, just look, at the, I mean, you can live your whole life and you can be rich and famous and people can think the world of you. But listen, it only takes one thing to destroy you. And all you have to do is look in the news media right now and you will see that. Because now, amazingly enough, even the world, even the worldly successful people are falling to pieces. Because all it takes is one accusation or one lie, and they can destroy you for the rest of your life. They can destroy all of your success, they can take away all of your influence. And some people are finding that out. And it will be a tragedy, but not as much of a tragedy as a spiritual fall. We can't show the works of God to our children if we forget them. We can't lead our home if we forget the Lord. Because there will be no leadership in the home if we forget the Lord. We had a, <clears throat> I don't know, we had kind of a routine at our house. You know, most of our kids grew up in their teenage years in Surrey Hills and when you came in the front door at Surrey Hills, there was a little entryway right there, and there was a set of stairs right to your left that went up to the rooms upstairs. And so that was the place that we cornered the kids. <laughs> and so the kids, just about all of the kids, um, spent some time sitting on the stairs. Joshua can say amen. <laughs> Joshua spent two lifetimes sitting on the stairs. And what happened when they were sitting on the stairs? Yeah, they were getting lectures from their parents. That's what happened. Did they do any good? <laughs> Maybe not, but we didn't give up. We were persistent. Did they believe everything we said? Probably not. Did they wish we'd get done? Probably so. But you know what? They'll remember those. And our only hope is that someday they'll look back and say, you know, they were right. Amen? And sometimes we were right. Maybe not always. But it was a good place to yell at the kids. That they should not forget the works of God. we got to be committed to this cause. Keeping our young people. Because in the day in which we live, young people are so subjected 
to all the garbage that's in the world today that it will be a miracle if any of them survive. Between all the trash that they can see and all the stuff that they can do with their thumbs and all the interference that they're going to get from the world and all of that stuff that they're going to be involved in, it will be simply amazing. That's why God's grace is so powerful. Is because where sin did abound, <coughs> grace did much more abound. Amen. Amen? But they won't know that if you don't tell them. Amen. They won't know that if you don't show them. They won't know that if you don't practice those things that are going to give them the opportunity to see that God actually is great. Don't forget the works of God. And lastly, it says, to keep his commandments. Boy, we don't like that word, commandments, do we? Commandments. I don't want any commandments. We got enough commandments. Yeah, I know, but let me tell you something. When you go to interview for your first big job, whatever it may be. The interviewer, although he's going to be a nice person, or he or she, um, is going to be a nice person, is going to tell you how wonderful it would be if you would come to work for their company. They're going to tell you this. What I want, for, they may not say these words, but they're going to tell you this. What I want from an employee is for you to do what you're told. And you're going to say, but I never did that before. And they're going to say, then you can look somewhere else. Sooner or later, we all have to grow up, right? And you're going to find out that that little world that you built and was so perfect and you were going to do everything your own way, only Frank Sinatra ever did that. At least he said he did it in his song. I did it my way. But you know what? I don't think he did. And you won't either. But you'll be better off doing it God's way. God gave us commandments for a reason. Keep his commandments. Why? Because it is the wisest, safest, surest thing that we can do. Is to keep his commandments. Not to ask how far we can get away from his commandments and still be saved. Not to see how many excuses we can make about not keeping his commandments. But to say, the reason that the Lord gave these is because they are good for us. It's the best thing that we can do. I encourage you to do that with your children. And you kids that are here, when you have children, I encourage you to do that with your children. So that when I'm dead and gone, you can tell your kids, Brother Barry said a hundred years ago that I was supposed to do this. Amen? Because it'll still be the same. The fight will still be the same. Talk to your kids. Is it awkward to talk with your children? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. But you got to do it anyway. You got to get through it. It's kind of like witnessing. You know, say, well, I can't be a witness. Well, you're going to be a witness one way or the other. You might as well do it right. Amen. If it's awkward, do it anyway. Why? Because the future is at stake. The future is at stake. Now, you may already have ruined your future, but other people's futures are still at stake. And we need to make sure that the next generation knows what God expects of them. You say, well, church attendance won't be very good if you keep telling them that. That's fine. But they need to know what they need to know.
So I encourage you to do that. Why is it that we tell them to do that? That they might set their hope in God, not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. He says, so that they might not be as their fathers. That, uh, that could give you cause for thought. We should always hope and pray and work toward the end that our kids are going to be better than we are. And that they're going to be more spiritual than we are. And that they're going to know more about the Lord than we do. And that they're going to be closer to him than we are. That's our job. And we should try to do our job. All through my, quote, professional career, I was always amazed at people who wanted to create empires by not sharing information with other people. So that they'd be the only one that knew stuff. That's crazy. <clears throat> if you ever get the opportunity to be in management, I, the first rule, I used to tell people all, this all the time. <laughs> I don't know how much positive results they got. The first rule is, if you know something, share it. Because someday, you're going to need somebody else to know that. And they're going to call you at home when you're sick. And you're not going to have anybody to do whatever it was that needed to be done. But you could have really easily. If you, if you know something, share it. If you know the Lord, share it. If you know what's right, share it. Do it lovingly. But share it. Needs to be shared. That they might not be, as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So, even though this is talking about us, whatever generation you're in, you're supposed to teach the next generation better than that. That's the goal, amen? What are your chances of achieving that goal? Well, if you don't try, the chances of achieving it are zero. They're just zero. Then he says, don't be like Ephraim. Now, I was a little confused about this, and I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm not sure exactly what instance this is referring to <clears throat> because you can study all about Ephraim and Ephraim had great warriors the tribe of Ephraim produced some great warriors and they were great leaders son of Joseph um, you know special you know, got got considered to be a full tribe and, and all of those things had all kinds of benefits but at some point in time maybe this is only conjecture from what I kind of picked up and from maybe some other commentators but when, uh, when the Philistines came in and took the ark away and they pursued after them and they tried to, uh, to get it back, this may have something to do with it. But however, whatever instance this is, we know it's true because it's here. So he says, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They had everything that was necessary. But they didn't follow Listen, we've got everything that's necessary. But it's our responsibility to follow through. It's our responsibility to be faithful. It's our responsibility to pass things on to the next generation. It's our responsibility to encourage others. It's our responsibility to be an example of someone who is trying to serve God. The point is that a majestic tribe, a tribe of the lineage of Joseph, turned back in the day of battle, and they didn't keep the covenant. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his works and his wonders, even though they had everything to perform with, and they came from good stuff. You've probably heard that phrase before. 
I don't know what happened to that guy. He came from such good stuff. Well, listen, as far as the Lord is concerned, I'm not sure there's any such thing as good stock. We're just all from Adam, and I'm not sure his stock either. But they had all the opportunities. Had all the chances. And we are not supposed to be like them. So I would encourage you this morning to be active in passing on your faith, and in passing on what God has given to you, and in passing on your abilities and your zeal to someone else, because that is your job. It's your job. And a lot of people nowadays don't want jobs. Responsibility has been taken out of the dictionary because we want authority, but we don't want any responsibility. Pass on your faith to your children or you will lose them. Pass on your faith to others as God gives opportunity because it's what God said to do. This is going to affect future generations. You know, we, we think sometimes that, well, we're a small church and you know, all, all, all the things that go along with that. Listen, we're a lot bigger than some. <laughs> but we've got some kids. And unfortunately, something happens to kids when they get to be 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. They think they know everything. And so they, yeah, then they turn stupid. Well, we did, yeah. Yeah. But somewhere along the line, those, those need to continue. They need to keep the covenant. They need to walk in his law. They need to not forget his works and his wonders. So I would encourage you to be active in passing on your faith. This is not just about us. This is about him. This is about our responsibility to our Savior. You want to help the planet? We all want to help the planet, right? Environmentalists go out and protest and carry signs. Save the planet! How about saving humanity? I mean, after all, who is it that has dominion over the planet? Save a little humanity. How are you going to do that? You're going to do that with the Word of God and nothing else. Nothing else. This is not about us. This is about a savior. This is about a king. This is about the comforter. This is about the keeper of our souls. And we have a responsibility to serve him and to pass on the things that we have learned. We have some generations here, and each generation represented here has a responsibility. And in order to exercise that, you will have to make a decision. A decision that will affect your soul and that will affect the rest of your life. The first decision you need to make is that Christ is going to be your Savior. Yeah. I know, people don't like the word decision when you make a decision for Christ. But use whatever term you want. But your heart needs to be changed by his heart. And then we need to walk with that. We need to have a relationship with that because we have a responsibility. That decision will affect your soul. And we do that that the generations to come might know. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. But you won't be able to do that if you don't know the Lord and if you don't know his strength and if you don't know any of the works that he has done.
How would you get there? You'd get there by just coming to Christ as a lost sinner and asking him to take all your trash and give him all your treasure. Amen? That's how. But we have a responsibility to the next generation to pass on these things that God has so freely given to us. Amen? Let's all stand. Brother Adam, you come. <clears throat> Lead us in a verse of invitation.